going to have uh, Pastor uh, Roy and uh, Melania come on up. Please give them a warm welcome. Good morning. I am glad to see you again. I am glad to be with you for worship the same God. Um, thank God for everybody. I pray for everybody God reward you all you do sacrifice in Christian embassy and Romania and beyond uh, I have one greeting for you in this morning Psalm 20 my the Lord answer you in the day of trouble my the name of the God of Jacob defend defend you amen God bless you Thank you. Thank you. And my baby. <laughs> I found her in Romania. <laughs> Pastor Tim and I have uh, a lot in common. <clears throat> my name is Roy, and I'm your friend. I am big and cuddly, basically a nice guy, and uh, I'm a lover of people, a lover of God, <clears throat> and um, I'd like to talk to you, please, in two parts, number, part number one, about the mission in Romania, and part number two, to ask you a question, part number one like to address first of all why we do what we do rather than tell you what we do it's important to know why we are doing it it's not to become big well-known popular people we have no interest in that we do have interest in being effective but uh, we seek no position uh, I've been a pastor been there, done that, got the t-shirt, not going back. <laughs> um, but we are in Romania. Why? Well, Romania is a strategic nation. I believe that God has ordained through Romania the gospel to go throughout Europe to bring Europe back to Jesus Christ. And Romania is the, uh, the spark, the lighthouse that will do that. Uh, we are there, why? It's because of what we believe. There are things that we believe that uh, impel us to do certain things. We believe in the truth of the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. We believe that through faith in Jesus Christ, a person can have eternal life. We believe that we can make a difference. A snowflake isn't very significant, but a snowstorm can close the town. And as we work together, God can do great things. We believe that, indeed, as I said, Romania is the key nation to bring Europe back to Christ. And we believe that God is forming a team a team. A man by himself can build a cabin. A team can build a skyscraper. And I notice to my left in this direction, there is a magnificent edifice arising out of a dream, a vision, and uh, just needs some water. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And God can provide that in many ways. You remember the preacher, he got up and he said, Lord, he said, uh, folks, we need, uh, let's use $54,000 for an example. He said, folks, we need $54,000 and we already have it. And the people of Florida and so on, he said, yes, and it's in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> this church is an extraordinary church. I believe... I have perceived 
and I've been around the block a few times, that uh, your pastors are different. They're a cut different. I don't want to say above, but they're just different. There is anointing. There is a mentality. There is a clarity. There is a, a, a love, a, a, a positive projection from them. I mean, they look good. They speak good. They are good, and you are blessed. I'll get an extra 10 bucks for that later. <laughs> the key, the key, the driving force is for God so loved. Not hate, not trying to punish, no. God so loved the world that he gave the best, his only begotten son, that whoever does one thing, not understand all the theology or, or no, no, just one thing, whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, big faith, great faith, no, just the sight of a mustard seed will do. Whoever believes in him, two things will happen. Number one, they will not perish. Number two, they have, help me now, everlasting life. Yes, that's why we're there. That's what we believe. We believe that there is an empty tomb. We believe that Jesus Christ really died, really was crucified, really was pierced with that, that, that spear, really was taken down from the cross. He really was put in that tomb. That is absolutely the truth. And that he rose again from the dead. And he's alive today. And he's still transforming lives. We believe that. What we do? Well, we take magnificent men and women like that. And we endeavor to train them. Our focus is in training. We can't do the job that's necessary. But what we can do is help others to do what God has called them to do, to bring our experience, our knowledge, and impart it as best we can to them so that they can do what God has called them to do, but do it more effectively. That is our desire. How do we do that? Well, we, we do that by doing conferences. Uh, Conferences means that we bring them together for a day, three days, five days, whatever happens to be appropriate for the people and the time. Uh, and we, we do some instruction, some teaching. Yes, we, uh, we have a good time. We have good fellowship. We do have good Romanian food. Some of you don't know about Saramala, but Sister Rodica knows Pastor Ethan. Most of them don't. You, you probably have tasted some reasonable facsimile of Pelletita. But we have good Romanian thin, some people call them crepes and pancakes. But we stuff it with chocolate or something like that. Oh, yes, so we have a good time. We even work with the youth. The youth. We have had seminary students uh, training them. One seminary student told me that for the first time in his life, now he's in seminary, not cemetery, <clears throat> and we ministered to him. We laid our hands on him. We gathered around. We prayed for him. That was the first time in his life that he ever had an experience of somebody just praying directly for him with the laying on of hands. Another man said that he hadn't cried for years. He cried by the touch of the master's hand. And all the good times of sitting around the campfire and chatting, singing, sharing testimonies, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, how do we do this? Part two is Americans. We need uh, ministers, not ministers, not beginners. We need seasoned men of God who can come and impart to them 
we're all different, you know. Uh, not everybody is as elegant as your pastors. You know, they, uh, they just project elegance, beautiful, powerful elegance, you know. And I'm sure they can cut it up, too. <laughs> but uh, there's a, some meal, some dance with the tambourines, some grow beards, like our brother Jim Kerwin. But there he is teaching in a public school. We can't do that here. We can do it in the former communistic nation of Romania. And so we do conferences. We bring pastors, and we have interpreters. There's no problem with uh, doing that. <clears throat> And um, we have distinguished gentlemen like your own George Barham right there. Uh, yes, amen. A magnificent, fine gentleman, sacrificially drove all the way to the Czech Republic and back. But when he was there, he ministered. And uh, to the, um, the other picture with the young lady in the foreground, her, 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 her father is here. I don't see him this morning. But her, her name is Corinne Deshaibi. Yes. And uh, so she was with us for six months. And um, women, women are not supposed to speak to men in Romania. I mean, they're not allowed to preach. They can speak, but they can't preach to men. Uh, so rather than complain what we can't do, we do what we can do. And we do it to the max. And so what we did, we got the women together. We got two, three hundred women together. And we turned loose on those women. Our sister, Pastor Angela Reed from New York. Now, Angela Reed is out of the box. Like your pastor, female. <clears throat> and we let her loose. Oh, boy. She, she was so filled with the Spirit of God. She was filled with the love of God. She had a passion. She had a desire. People wept as she ministered. People were healed as she ministered. It was so good. Did I tell you that she's black? They love the color black. I got some tell stories to tell you about that. Well, let me tell you a little story about my black brother from New York who came over there, and he was preaching in one church, and one woman, a Romanian woman, after he got preached, she came forward to greet him, and she planted one kiss right on his lips. <laughs> oh, yeah, incredible, but beautiful. And uh, we even had men call the pastor and ask if they could go and sit in on what was happening in that woman's conference. And this is my wish list. <laughs> I believe that um, Pastor Tim sent a, uh, his first missionary uh, team to the nation of Romania. I believe that he also married a Romanian woman, an extraordinary woman. And uh, I believe that, therefore, he is destined for it. I have been here. I've listened to him preach. I've listened on him. He is a good preacher. He is a solid preacher. He does not beat people over the head, but he is a nurturer. He lifts. He's a positive preacher. I think Rodika may have taught him that, but, I mean, it's a great... <laughs> great ministry. I believe that he is, uh, their, their elegance serves a purpose to reach leadership, to reach those that perhaps some others cannot reach. And uh, so I, that's on my wish list, and I believe that uh, that will happen. It's hard work, and sometimes, you know, you just got to take a break and relax for a while, as our brother Rick Dill there just said, <laughs> he fell asleep in a chair. But, you know, that's a natural, but there's also spiritual rest. And uh, uh, in one of our conferences, there was prayer offered. And there's a pastor down before the Lord. I mean, his body was just shaking like a leaf in the wind. And his wife ministering to him and several of his sons, he's got three sons, gathered around there to see Daddy being touched by the hand of God. You hear that, young man? Okay. 
Uh, it's going to take a team effort. Uh, this is, it's too big. My job is not only to go. My job is kind of a John the Baptist role. I prepare the way. I build the relationships. I seek uh, and uh, look for opportunities because the job is too big. Um, I just can't do it. But I'm there to prepare the way for others to do it. I seek no position. I love what I do. This is what I was born to do. This is why God put me on earth, to prepare places for other people, to help other people be that all that they can be. And I'm very glad for the response. We have a job for everybody. If you, God put it in your heart to come to Romania or something of that nature, come with your pastors and so on, whatever your skill is, we have a place for you. Uh, God anoints people not only to preach, but like our brother uh, Tecchio over there, Brother David, you know, he's anointed to do that. He's good. You don't have to preach in order to be anointed of God. You can do what God has given you to do and do it with excellence because God called you to do that. Yes, we don't have the music ministry that you have, but we do the best we can with what we've got because the principle is don't complain about what you don't have. Use what you do have. Remember David in the sling? Remember Moses with just the staff? Okay, and if, if the musicians don't show up, you just scrape the barrel, and that's your humble servant right there, uh, yodeling along. Uh, um, it made him in a beautiful tones, but it was a lot of love. <laughs> and uh, what do we do? Well, we work with men and women of God and uh, help them. How? Three areas primarily. Leadership, personal evangelism, worship. Leadership is important. Being godly and preaching well and so on, that's good. But you've got to couple that with the desire to lift people, to help people, not to domineer them or keep them under the thumb. Lift them up. Well, what if they get better than me? Well, a rising tide lifts all the boats. If you're lifting, rising the tide, God will take care of you. What if they love them more than they love me? You just do what God has called you to do, and the, God, the, the people will love you for doing that. Number two, personal evangelism. Wherever you are, there is an evangelistic field, and most evangelism should happen outside of, not within, the church walls. Can I get an amen? amen. If I get boring, just give me an amen. <laughs> okay. I asked one brother, I said, if, uh, if, um, if I get boring, just raise your hand, you know, and I'll talk faster and louder. Well, at one point, he felt he needed to worship the Lord, so <laughs> I talked faster and louder. Worship is more than reading so uh, songs, uh, hymns out of a hymn book or on a screen. It's the opening of the heart and spirit to touch the Father and for the Father to touch the... So that's what we do. Where do we do it? Well, we do it at this place called Apavia. What is Apavia? It's called living Apa, water, living via. Living water, Apavia, in uh, Romania. Um, <clears throat> and here is the uh, front of the magnificent house that God enabled us to buy in 2004. That's over 10 years ago. The price was $5,000. It was burned out shell. They heard American wanted to buy it. The price rose to $6,000. I bought it. I grabbed it because I saw the potential. And today we sleep 50 people there. And uh, you'll see in a moment um, how that's going. The upper church there is 1,100 members. That's where I found my wife, Melania. And... Um, we get opportunity to minister to large churches and small churches as well. It really doesn't matter why. God, sometimes I drive for a, two hours to get to a church to preach 40 minutes and then drive two hours back again. I said, Lord, uh, is this a invest, good investment of my time and finances? And this is what the Lord put in my heart. 
just get one person. Everywhere you go, just get one man, one woman, where the light turns on, where the, 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 there's an encounter between themselves and the, and the Holy Spirit, and it's worth it. A thousand times over, go get that one. And that one can change the world. Amen? So that took care of that. Well, how's travel in Romania? Well, $7 a gallon, thank you very much. Um, uh, but uh, never have we not gone someplace because we didn't have enough, in our case, diesel. So God has opened doors from a humble beginning because of the, the partnership of others. Uh, God has opened doors throughout Europe. And uh, here we are in the Czech Republic. And I believe that Romania is called to be like a launching pad, like a, a landing ground, where from here God can launch um, people, ministries, Rodikas, Pastor Tim, Dr. Lambert, you know, send them out because these people have spirit-filled, powerful ministries that today Europe needs to hear this. Europe is no longer Christian. It's, uh, as one uh, other missionary said, Europe is pagan. They need to be brought back, and I believe that through Romania, that's why we're there. So God has opened Serbia, Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, France, and um, now for the first time we're going into Poland. By, I mean, we are going, not me, but somebody working through the ministry through a relationship that we were able to open up is going into Poland. And since I made this PowerPoint, uh, some other nations have opened up, like Spain, Italy, Belgium, and going back into other places in France. And so the, the people are not resistant to the gospel. No, we don't want, no, that does not happen. Here's, here's the secret. You go with love, you go with respect. You don't talk down to people. You, you, you build a relationship with them, a positive relationship. Not if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell kind of thing. No, no. But uh, you, you minister to them, they will listen to you. At the right time when the seeds have been sown and the doors will be open. And the doors are open, and we're very grateful for that. Where are we going? What are we doing? What's our vision? Well, <clears throat> through the significant help of this church, in the middle of your building program, your pastors and this church sowed into the ministry that they enabled us to buy. This property there we call the Land of Promise. It's seven-tenths of an acre. It's high ground. You can see that we look down at the village there. This is the high ground of the village. And the, the, the horizon is the limitation of your visibility on a clear day. <clears throat> this is the front of the building. And uh, we don't have growing pains. We have growing blessings. I pray that every ministry will have uh, the, the kind of uh, challenges that uh, there are too many people coming. We need more room. You have that challenge. That's why that's going on there. That's why the 50 whatever thousand dollars is going to come in for the war. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. Why? Okay, here, follow me here. 2005, we did our first conference. Uh, 16 attended. Melania attended. She had her eye on me. Oh, I hear an objection over there. Okay, okay. The wise guy, she calls me. 2005, we did our first pastor's conference, 2005. 2006, a bunch of teenagers, youth, Americans, and Romanians together. There we were doing road work as a public servant. Uh, the high school class came in 2007, 20 strong. 2008, excuse me, 30 youth. 2008, again, a different group of 30 youth, Romanians and Americans uh, mixed. Um, as the twig is bent, so grows the, tr the tree. You know, with the, uh, 
you saw the, the, the girls and the boys at the beginning here. Powerful ministry, changing lives. Never be the same again. Respect for authority. Uh, basic uh, life truths. Uh, never be the same again. In 2010, 52 youth and leaders. We built our conference hall for 40 people. And in 2010, we're already maxing out. 2012, 72, we packed them in there. This particular conference was videotaped and sent by way of uh, Alpha and Omega television throughout uh, southeastern Europe. And um, 2012 and 13, over 100. Where did you put them, Roy? We found room. We made it work. Wherever there was a carpet, there was a sleeping bag stuffed with one kid, <laughs> and so on. So why do we need to expand? Because the need is there. Why do you need to expand? The need is there. Powerful ministries growing up, doing in their communities what God has called them to do. And so this was one of the buildings on the land of promise, we call it. And uh, I saw not cattle and the chickens in there and the hay storage, but I saw a one-bedroom cottage. And there it is under construction, and uh, pretty soon there'll be a young couple, I'll introduce you to them later, who will be living there. This is a satellite eyes view of um, our village, Peshtera, and there the yellow circle is where we are now, Apavia, and now the next circle will be the land of promise. And that's where we are. How long will it take you to get from one place to the other? Well, most of you will do it in 10 minutes. Uh, your humble servant here right now, a little longer. But I may be slow, but I get there. <laughs> and uh, so on. So it's a golden investment. Your primary focus here, dear saints, of course, is the home ground. You've got to have a launching pad and so on. And so that's your, that's your focus. But... Um, uh, thank God as, as uh, partnering with us. Uh, we're interested more in the ministry than in the money. I want this man and this woman to minister in Romania and bring some of you with them. That is strategic. That is important. And so with gratefulness, you see the young man uh, with his uh, fiance. Uh, with him. That's our nephew. He has addicted himself to the ministry. He's now working with us, has been for four years or so, and now he's taking himself a bride that about a week after we return to Romania, there'll be a wedding. And they're going to live in that one-bedroom cottage on the land of promise. Isn't that absolutely adorable? And so we thank you, brothers and sisters, and that's part one. Was that okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Retired folks should get refired, rehired, and resent. <clears throat> and uh, there is no lack for opportunity. But now there's part two, and I want to begin by asking you a question, please. Is there a champion in the house? Is there a champion in the house this morning? Do I see any champions here? I feel championship uh, seated in those pews. I, I feel it. Uh, I think there's a lot of hard work that's been going on, but I just want to ask the question, is there a champion in the house? Now, three questions only human beings ask. No other living organism, no cow, no monkey, no dolphin uh, asks. The, they don't even ask one of these questions. The question number one, is origins. Where do I come from? Question number two, where am I going? What is my destiny? And question number three we're going to try to address this morning is, why am I here? You never heard a chicken say, bah, bah, why am I here? Why am I here? Or a cow, why am I here? No. They, 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 it's, out of their, it's just out of their league. Okay, now if you go to evolution, they'll teach you that your chemicals and energy and uh, 
time and chance, and you just happened to pop out by a um, cosmic accident. And so they, they give you significance by telling you that you don't have any. And um, you're just another kind of animal. Uh, you just... Uh, like a dog or an insect or a cow, you know, you live here, you're wet spot, and, and you're gone, and then now into the next generation. And so really your significance is a big, fat, round zero, if you ask evolution. If you'll forgive me for just a moment, your humble servant, that's me. Um, I do have a degree in physics and mathematics. I would say that I'm reasonably intelligent. Some people don't agree, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. But <clears throat> and so I, I study evolution. I study it because it's good to know what the enemy is teaching. And I have come to the conclusion that Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Porky Pig, and Bugs Bunny, and throw in Santa Claus, and evolution is about the same thing. Um, I mean, the scientific evidence is so overwhelming when you study the DNA and the DNA molecule and so on. It's, it's compelling scientific evidence that the information, who put that information in the DNA molecule? Uh, information only comes from intelligence. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Now we go over and we open the, the book that never changes. Science changes weekly. And uh, the, you go to the book and <clears throat> you have significance. You have worth. You have a destiny. Your life has a purpose. And I see some, some heads with a little gray on it and I would like to tell you speak to my more mature brothers and sisters, such as myself, hopefully. Uh, Moses didn't get started until he was 80 years old. So don't die until you're dead. <laughs> In the meantime, live, spit, kick, rock the boat, do something, get out of the boat. Just a suggestion. Okay. Yes. You have great potential. Everything you've done until now, all your good, the bad, the ugly, everything you've accomplished till this day is your achievement. But what God has put within you, the talent, the abilities, the creativity, the intelligence, the passion, the vision that you have not yet done, that's your potential. And your potential is greater than your achievement because it builds on your achievement. You say, well, all my achievements aren't that great. We'll talk about that in a minute. But your life does have significance. Yes, it does. If you're here and you're breathing, and you are, I observe, you're, you're here for a reason. There's a reason, and it's more than just being uh, going, getting an education, getting married, procreate, um, get a job, retire, and then die. Eternal significance is what God put within you. Not to grovel in the, the sticks and mud of the earth and growl for insects and worms or something. You were destined to fly, fly high, see further, rise higher with the wind of the Holy Spirit Haramandai carrying you along. Uh, that's what you're destined to do. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as of eagles. So I ask the question again. Is there a champion in the house this morning? Oh, I hear you. You can't be silent. You have to respond. Amen? Well, that's a good sign, but uh, I'll ask the question again later because uh, I want to touch your heart. God is looking for champions. Why? Because the world needs you. 
wherever you look, our uh, esteemed officer with the handgun, Glock, no doubt, uh, on his side, knows this as well as, or more than any, wherever you go, there's pain, there's trouble, there's sorrow, there's hurt. You know that. And uh, you're the champion that will bring Christ to these situations. People are dying. Fathers are carrying their sons who have been shot. There's loneliness. Oh, Roy, loneliness? Yeah, just remember Robin Williams. Made us all laugh. Deathly depression under the mask. Incredible. Children are starving, even as we're here this morning. If, 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 if we could send it to them all the table scraps from the Golden Corral, they would treasure it. Syria. Afghanistan. Iraq. Incredible, inhuman things being done to human beings. Does the world need champions? Yes. Does God need champions? Yes. Where are these champions? They are here this morning. It should touch my heart, a mother trying to comfort her weeping children full of fear because of things that she cannot prevent the bombing, the slaughter. And so the world is on fire. God needs champions. God needs you. And here we have another flame, fire burning within this church. And that's the fire of the Holy Spirit. Oh, when God baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, it's not for you to speak in tongues. Tongues is a tool but the job is done. Ye shall receive power, and ye shall become witnesses. Witnessing doesn't only happen by talking. It happens by going. It happens by sacrifice. It happens by giving yourself. I surrender all. It happens by a process where God makes champions. A biblical example I love to use is David. Because I, I love Daniel and I love Joseph, but those men were too good for me. I need a man down to earth, an earthy guy like David. I uh, connect with a guy like David. I'm so glad God put him in the Bible because then I know there's hope for me. You know, just a sinner saved by grace. By grace it started, by grace it is, and by grace it's going to finish. And... Uh, if you're going to follow God, you're going to meet enemies. If you want a bowl of cherries, do something else. But if you want significance, pay the price. And here, uh, this uh, enemy with a big mouth, you know, hurling words of fear and intimidation and uh, speaking out against the Lord and his people and uh, challenging, they had a champion. But there was a little boy who heard this, a young man, and uh, he didn't want to be a champion particularly. He just wanted to shut that guy up and put him down. And he did. You do that. In order to become a champion, I've never met a champion who said, oh, I'm a champion. How did that happen? Well, no. A champion is always intentional. you got to want it. you got to focus. Oh, uh, instead of telling people what they can't do and what they shouldn't do, just give them a dream, give them a focus, and they don't want to do that stuff. When you see the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to taste that kind of life again. Why? Because you used to eat 
cardboard burgers at McDonald's, but now you've tasted filet mignon, the finest of the wheat. And you don't go back there. Yes. To become a champion, you got to want it. I, I was born and raised in New York City. I'm on 33rd Street and Toyd Avenue. You know, so you you got to want it. Well, you need to have the passion, the desire, the deep commitment to want it. So let's go number one. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not to know about him, but to know him. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know him, know him, like you know your wife or husband. Know them on an intimate level. You want to know him. Yes, nobody said it would be easy. It's just worth it. A thousand times over, it's worth it. Ask the Apostle Paul. I reckon none of these things to be anything for the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, to know him in the fellowship of the sufferings and death. You get to the next step, and you see him in the power of his resurrection. Oh, yeah, that's where it cooks. That's where you're destined to be, working in the power of his resurrection. Isaiah is a good man, religious man, but one day, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And when you're in the presence of God and you're experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you'll see him. He's high. He's lifted up. And Isaiah saw that. And then what he did, he saw the power of God. You'll see. Uh, when, you, when you have small faith, the problem is big. But when you have big faith, the problem is small. What's 50-something thousand dollars for water? I mean, God can do it in many ways. He can provide the money or he can touch the heart of the officials and say, hey, we need you. We'll buy the water. But when you see the Lord high and lifted up, you see the power, you see the provision of God. God doesn't call you to do something unless he provides the resources to do it. You just go as far as you can with what you've got, like Joshua crossing the Jordan. The river didn't open up when they were a mile away, a half a mile away, or a yard or an inch away, the water didn't open up until, help me now, Pastor. They put their feet in the water. Put your feet in the water. Don't stop. Just a suggestion. And then you will know why God put you on the earth. Don't try to be like everybody else. God did not ordain you to be like everybody else. If you're just like everybody else, you've been pushed into the cookie-cutter mold that the devil wants to make you. What makes you significant and what gives you worth is how you're different than them. The Lord says, come out from among them and be who I've called you to be. Be separate, says the Lord. And then don't get involved in that unclean stuff anymore. Okay, sometimes you've got to deal with negativity. Watch this. You've probably dealt with this negative negativity. Here's the king who's hiding away in his tent because of Goliath. The king hiding away in his tent says to, to David, you can't do that. You can't. That's what the devil will say. That's what the enemy will say. And the voice that's most effective in stopping you is what you say to yourself. Self-talk. But he says, you can't do this. That's what the, your history will tell you. Oh, look at you. You have no track record. You can't do this. Well, your past doesn't determine your future. Your faith determines your future. Your past determines your experience and your testimony. But we'll get there in a moment. And 
So he told them all the reasons why he can. Not enough education. Not enough money. Not enough this. Not enough that. And not enough of the other thing. Always, always an arm's length of reason why not. And here's the, but look at the enemy. Look at the problem. Look, look, look at the enemy. I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. I see looking unto Jesus, who is the author, but not just the author, he's the of faith, faith, faith. God doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. Your pastor has preached this sermon in many ways and the same truths. I just dish it out a little differently. It's the same message. Go out and do it anyway. All the naysayers, they said I couldn't do it, and I went out and I did it anyway. I went to Romania at 60 years of age. Some people call me crazy. You know? Took all my retirement from being an Assemblies of God pastor, $23,000. I bought that property for 6000 and I used the rest of the money to fix that burnt-out shell until it was uh, usable for our first conference. I had nothing. What'd you do, Roy? I had no job. I'd left uh, my pastor. What'd you do, Roy? What'd you do? I took retirement early. I waited till I was 62, and I took retirement early. But why didn't you wait till 65 and get more? Because I didn't have time to wait that long. I was broke. Well, what did you live on? My retirement. Yeah. Uh, your, your pension check will go far over in Romania. Okay. Well, then you need a testimony. What you've experienced, your tears, your pain, your suffering, what you have gone through, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's not only the good that is your testimony, it's the difficulties you've gone through. Even your failure is part of your testimony. Because I read someplace in some book, it said something like this. I think it was a book called Romans. I think it had a couple chapters. It was talking about chapter 8. And it had a little verses in there, and it was verse 28. And I think it goes something like this. And we know, not that we hope, or we guess, or maybe, yes. No, this is something that we know. I want to know him. Uh, and that's something that we know. What is it that we know? That God works. How many things? How many things? I can't hear you. Together for what? He's still doing it, ladies and gentlemen. David had testimony. It was through difficulty. He had a testimony. He met the lion. He met the bear. You have a testimony. What you've gone through. Brothers and sisters, you're here this morning, and I pray that you'll never be the same again. You'll not be intimidated. You'll not be held down. But you'll rise and you'll do, and you'll go what God has put in your heart, advisedly, correctly, but do it. Uh, cut the excuses. And of course, you'll never lose if you don't surrender. Okay, here's this chunky man. I identify with chunky men. Uh, uh, not everybody can have a real man's anatomy, but uh, <laughs> uh, they named him after the church on the hill. Winston. And there he was, and uh, he's the prime minister of England, and the Nazis were bombing the stuffing out of his country. London was burning with buzz bombs. And what did he do? He got on the radio, and this is what he said. He said, we'll fight him in France, we'll fight him. The landing grounds, we'll find them in the sea. That's not maybe what it says up there, but just listen to me and read it at the same time. You know, we'll fight them not with less and less confidence, but with growing confidence. Like Abraham, who against hope, he still had the audacity to 
believe in hope. You, in spite of all that, believe in hope. Keep going. We'll fight him wherever we need to. We'll fight him in the air. We'll fight him in the beaches. We'll fight him on the ocean. We'll fight, we'll fight, we'll fight. You, fight, fight, fight. Don't give up. And this is what he said here. Here we come. Here we come. Help me. What does that say? I can't hear you. I don't care. I don't hear you. We shall never surrender. Amen. And we will never surrender. Amen. I hope you're enjoying listening to this as much as I am here speaking to you behind this august pulpit. It's an honor for me, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Galatians says something like this. That be not weary in well-doing. Many of you, you're doing well. And the admonition is be not weary because there's coming a due season. Your bill has is coming due. Your house payment, your car payment, uh, your electric bill, it's coming due. But God has a due time too. And he's the one who's going to pay it. Because you've been investing, you've been paying, and now there's coming a due time. Don't give up. Uh, hang in there, baby. And keep doing what God has called you to do because there's coming a due time, but only the provision is <clears throat> if you faint not. If you faint not. Okay? And I use the next uh, illustration. As you know, hey, you couch potato, get off the couch. Leave that remote control <laughs> someplace. And, and uh, you have a ministry. You have a ministry. Folks, just let me please make a little sidebar here. Credentials on the wall does not put you in the ministry. A salary doesn't, well, I'm, I'm going to go into ministry when I get a salary. No, salary doesn't put you in the ministry. A name tag doesn't put you in the ministry. In fact, a position doesn't put you in the ministry. The only thing that puts you in the ministry is doing ministry. If it looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, it's a, it's a duck. If you're doing the ministry, you're a minister. And nobody can take that away from you. Just get up and do it. They probably have a ministry here for you. I heard there was a ministry waiting for somebody with children and kids and royal rangers and so on like that. That's a ministry. As a twig is bent, so grows the tree. Get those kids. Honor those. You put your best teachers with the kids. Most people who today confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior did so before they were 24 years of age. Some of our great American heroes went through difficult times went through great warfare, but we honor them today by putting them on the dollar bill. <clears throat> okay, Dave, help me. My remote is getting a little weak here. Let's see. Do, is it still shining? Yes, it is. Okay, there. Okay, back one. Back one. There you are. Okay. You remember Rocky, you know, and he's fighting against, uh, what's the name of that theater? Apollo, Apollo, you know, and I, I mean, Apollo's big, he's powerful, he's well-trained, he's built, and, you know, he's knocking the stuffing out of Rocky and uh, beat him to, against the ropes, bouncing off the ropes. You, maybe you saw the movie, but I saw the movie, but I'm evangelistically speaking now, you know, because I'm preaching, you know. And they beat him until he's down on the ground, and you can see the manager in the corner, and he's saying, stay down. He's too big. He's too strong. You've endured too much beating, okay? Your mouth, your nose is bleeding. You've got a cut lip. Stay down. Play, play. One, two, three, four. Rocky, stay down. Play dead. Five, six. He's getting up. Watch him. He's getting up. Look, he's getting up. Stay down. Stay down. He's getting up. Ten, seven. He's up. He's up. He got up again. When you get up again, then you too can become a champion. 
There's one whom you love. They beat him to a pulp. They nailed him to a cross. He hung there and whimpered out until he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Then they put him in a cold, dank cave, wrapped him, spiced him up, and wrapped him like a mummy. And on the third day, in spite of everything, he got up again. He got up again. Suggestion. Get up again. Brothers and sisters, get up again. Don't stay down. Rocky got up again. Jesus got up again. Do thou likewise. Get up again. This is why we do what we do. We're not here to play games as a church. We're here for a purpose because we, we have a destiny and we need training. We need teaching. We need some things because we have one who died and who rose again from the dead. And he's with us here this morning. Do you sense him? Do you feel him speaking to you? Have you tuned me out and you're listening to another voice, the voice of the Spirit of God ministering to you, lifting you, encouraging you, bringing the dream back to your remembrance? Get up again. And sometimes it seems like you can't go ahead as a closed door. All closed doors are not necessarily from the devil. And sometimes God says, don't go there. That relationship died, leave it alone. Maybe that wasn't the right relationship. Sometimes it's appropriate to, I'm to say goodbye. A closed door is okay. But we have this promise that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. We think of Peter sinking, but what about those guys watching him, those timid souls sitting in the boat, watching a man of faith get out of the boat? Uh, you never hear about those guys who were sitting in the boat. You only hear about the guy who got out of the boat. And who became the great leader of the church in Jerusalem? The guy who got out of the boat. Get out of the boat. He will be there if you sink. <laughs> but you'll never forget you got out of the boat. Uh, and so in closing here, you know, we have problems. Sometimes we feel like we're getting beaten up. We've been rejected. I've been rejected. How about you? Have you ever felt the, the power of rejection, the sinking feeling of rejection? I've been there. I've done that. You feel broke, you know, empty pockets, and uh, a mind that's a weak and a back that's strong. Or you sense the, 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 the crushing sense of loneliness, and you want to just stick up your hand and say, I give up. Well, the principle is never surrender. Never surrender. Because we have the power. We're Pentecostal people. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the new birth through uh, the vicarious death of our Lord Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, what for? To stay there? No. To get up and do what God has called us to do. So it doesn't matter what other people see in you. It matters what you see in you. Okay? And you may think you're the pussycat, but you look in the mirror of God's word. <laughs> you see a mighty man and woman of, of valor. Amen? Joshua was here. He fit the battle of Jericho, and the wall came tumbling down. He was here. He's dead. He's gone. He did what he had to do. David was here. He hit the giant. Giant's gone. David's gone. Gideon did a mighty work. God called him who did, never did anything brave in his life, a mighty man of valor. Oh, don't you, because you haven't gone into your destiny yet doesn't mean it ain't coming. John the Baptist, he didn't fit in, didn't eat the same food, didn't dress the same way, 
but he was here. He did a great way. He introduced the world to the Son of God. He must increase. I must decrease. He was here. He did what he could. He's gone. The great apostle Paul, he wrote his greatest epistles while he was in jail. What do you do when you're in a hard place? They're all dead. They're all gone. They were here. But brothers and sisters, I just announced to you, now it's your turn. Now it's your time. Now you're here. Time to rise up. Time to do what God has called you to do. How? By the things we know to do. Pray, believe, submit to the, our proper authorities, and uh, go and do what you can. And you too become a champion. So I just want to ask the question in closing. Are there any champions in the house this morning? Yeah. Do I see any <laughs> Do I see any champions? Do I hear any champions? Yeah. Oh yes. You know, I I see something in you. I see something in you. I don't know what it is. Oh yes, I see it. I see a chair.